Well, welcome to the team this morning. This is uh, week 10 out of 24. I hope you guys uh, appreciate the effort we went through to put the stars up for you. Uh, today just to uh, decorate for the holiday season. Actually, this is part of our, our church-wide uh, celebration and a big event we have coming up this coming weekend uh, that many of us will be attending. It's a musical production called um, Worthy. A um, couple of things by way of announcement. Our team schedule, as I put in the email, we meet obviously today, the next week, the 14th, and then the 21st. We will meet. Then we'll take the week, the Friday after Christmas off uh, for one week break before we start up again in January. Then we go straight through to the end of the team season. Um, got, uh, last week I mentioned to you that we are looking for some, um, just a little bit of help as we are down, actually we'll, we, we, by this Friday we'll be down two people in our facility staff. And James Chavez, who manages our facilities, looking for a little bit of help. So here's a couple things you can do today. If you think you're interested and have a little bit of time over the next month or so to help out here and there, stop by the table right in the lobby, and James has his email uh, on a little piece of paper. You can take that and let him know that he'll get you the calendar and all the places you could help out a little bit here and there. So just do that today. I'll remind you at the end of the session today. And then for today, if you have an hour or so today following team, you can help um, clean up the room and get all the tables uh, put away, and you can uh, help a chair set up today because we're getting ready for a very, very busy weekend. So that's just today. So if, you, if, if spontaneously you can take an hour today, we need your help, and I'll remind you at the end of the session today. All right, here's our story today. Some of you may remember this from a few years ago. Uh, Buddy and his wife Edna went to the state fair every year, and every year Buddy would say, Edna, I'd like to take a ride in that there helicopter. Edna always replied, I know, Buddy, but that there helicopter ride is 50 bucks, and 50 bucks is 50 bucks. One year, Buddy and Edna went to the fair, and Buddy said, Edna, I'm 85 years old. If I don't ride that there helicopter now, I may never get another chance. And then to reply as she always did, buddy, that helicopter ride is 50 bucks, and 50 bucks is 50 bucks. The pilot overheard the couple and said, folks, I'll make you a deal. I'll take the both of you for a ride in my helicopter, and if you can stay quiet for the entire ride and don't say a word, I won't charge you a penny. But if you say one word, it's $50. Buddy and Edna agreed, and up they went. The pilot did all kinds of fancy maneuvers, but not a word was heard. He did his daredevil tricks over and over again, still not a word. When they landed, the pilot turned to Buddy and said, by golly, I did everything I could to get you to yell out, but you didn't. I'm impressed. Buddy replied, well, to tell you the truth, I almost said something when Edna fell out, but you know, 50 bucks is 50 bucks. Well, I've titled our session today, Session 10, Little Big Man, and some of you may remember that. The title came to me, I think it's from a movie way back in the late 60s, early 70s that had Dustin Hoffman in it called Little Big Man, but it's not about that. Uh, We're continuing the story of uh, King Saul and David, and last week uh, we took a look at the friendship, the unusual, unlikely friendship that developed between Jonathan, who was King Saul's son, and David. It was unusual because it, was, uh, it said that they loved each other uh, and they were loyal to each other. It was unlikely because Jonathan's father, King Saul, uh, was uh, insanely jealous of David. We'll go into that again today. And today we're going to see, uh, uh, go dig a little deeper into that story and see what power and pride uh, can do to a man. So I'm going to show you a clip uh, today. Actually, today was, is another double feature. I'll explain the second clip later. Um, but uh, the clip we're watching first is from Braveheart, and it's the scene. It's a scene involving King Edward the First of England, who was nicknamed Longshanks, and Longshanks had a problem with his son's best friend. So let's take a look. What news of the North? Nothing new, Your Majesty. We've sent riders to speed any word. I heard the word in France, where I was fighting to expand your future kingdom. The word, my son, is that our entire Northern army is annihilated. And you have done nothing. I I have ordered conscriptions. They're assembled and ready to depart. Excuse me, sire, but there's a very urgent message from York. Come. Um. 
っていきます。Thank you, sir. Wallace has sacked York. Huh? Wallace has sacked York. This person who speaks to me as though I needed his advice. I have declared Philip my High Counselor. Is he qualified? I am skilled in the arts of war and military tactics, sir. Are you? And tell me, what advice would you offer on the uh, present uh, situation? Oh, oh, oh! Longshanks, I think, had a bit of a problem with anger management. But we'll see some, some similarities in the story today. First Samuel, way back in the Old Testament, chapter 24. Let me read, this is a long narrative uh, story again, but let me, I'm going to break it up and teach kind of as we go along. So follow along closely, <clears throat> beginning. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. Now remember, uh, Saul... Um, has been uh, trying to get rid of David because he's jealous. We'll get into that a little bit later. The Philistines were the enemy of Israel. Uh, and in Gedi, this phrase uh, in Hebrew means springs of the goats, and it refers to a mountainous region of Israel south of Jerusalem on the western edge of the Dead Sea. It's a great place to hide. Uh, I visited that area a few years ago when we traveled to the Holy Land, and it's desolate um, a, a region. There's, it's rocky and barren, and there, there, there are uh, small mountains and craggy places, uh, and actually you can still see uh, wild goats uh, uh, Ibex, I think they call them, uh, up in the hills of that area. Uh, and there are springs of fresh water available, so it was a great place for David to be hiding. Verse 2, so Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David because he's trying to kill him and his men near the crags of the wild goats. First thing we see here in the story uh, is what I'm calling the smallness of Saul. My wife and I went to see... Um, Hamilton a few weeks ago. How many of you have been able to see that show? A bunch of you, yeah. Um, we got, uh, uh, new, new tickets came out and we went to a matinee. Um, and it's an amazing uh, kind of show and there's a lot of history in that. I, 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 when I go to see historical things, I usually read up on it and try to find out where they're off, where they're on. And there's a lot of good history in there. But the br brief outline of the story is both Hamilton and Aaron Burr were among the founding fathers of our nation, but they were longstanding political rivals, enemies really. And what's interesting is that both of these men uh, did uh, rather foolish things that resulted in their uh, fall from grace and really... Um, interrupted and destroyed uh, not only their careers, but in Hamilton's case, his life. Now, Hamilton's fall from grace before he even got into the duel with Burr involved the first uh, sex scandal in American history. He had an affair uh, and then was extorted uh, for money to try to cover it up. That eventually went public, resulted in his son getting into a duel, trying to defend his honor, and he was killed in a duel. And then later, Burr's fall from grace was a result of challenging Hamilton to a duel because he was tired of Hamilton fighting against him politically, and he wanted him to apologize for disparaging his character. Uh, and then when they had the duel, Hamilton died as a result. Burr's political career was effectively over, and he lived the rest of his life in disgrace. So it's really a tragic story of two men. And we've actually seen seen this kind of story over and over again in our own time, in our own recent memory. For example, highly successful men, highly accomplished men, people like Richard Nixon, O.J. Simpson, Pete Rose, Bill Cosby, and I could go on and on and on. Successful men all suffer dramatic and shocking fall from grace due to a collapse of their personal character and integrity. Well, that, that's what happens to King Saul. It's an ancient story, but a very modern story. King Saul began well enough, chosen and anointed as the very first king of Israel. His mandate was to keep God's covenant, that is to obey God and to protect the people of God or the nation of Israel from all their enemies. 
Saul also, interestingly, the Bible's got these little details. He looked the part. In 1 Samuel 9, I don't have this printed for you, but we read, Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as can be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. Little details. So Saul was not only chosen to be king, he was tall, head taller than anyone, and handsome. But power and position eventually corrupted both Saul's faith and his character. And one of the things we see is that he became proud. And his, pr his pride fueled some very poor decisions. Let me give you three examples. In 1 Samuel 13, we read a story where uh, Saul leads uh, his troops into battle against this enemy called the Philistines. Uh, and they, were, they got pinned into a bad situation. Uh, the, and the, the Philistines were threatening to overrun uh, the troops of Israel. And so he's waiting for Samuel, who is the prophet and sort of the mouthpiece of God, to arrive to offer a sacrifice to ask for God's favor. And Samuel said, I'll be there in seven days. God wants you to wait till I get there to offer the sacrifice. Saul waits seven days, but he can't wait any longer. Some of his men are starting to, to desert. And so rather than waiting a little longer to obey God for Samuel to arrive, he offers the sacrifice himself, which was a direct violation of the command of God himself. So his pride and his fear led him to disobey. Saul assumed he could make his own rules because he was king. Second story, two chapters later, 1 Samuel 15. Saul again leads uh, his, his warriors into battle against another enemy, this enemy called the Amalekites. Uh, and God tells him in no uncertain terms that when you go into battle, you are to destroy the Amalekites completely, everything, including their livestock and all their animals. Okay, so it's a, Old Testament's a pretty brutal, bloody place. Saul wins the battle, but then he decides to keep some of the best of the spoils, some of the best of the animals for himself. Seems like a small thing. He already won the battle, but he did not obey God's command in detail. And then he lies about it to Samuel, again, disregarding the command of God. And then we read some of the saddest words in the entire Old Testament. Uh, and again, I don't have these printed for you, but in verse 10, of uh, 1 Samuel 15, it says, the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Third story, because of Saul's failures, God eventually chooses David, begins to prepare him to become king following Saul. David kills Goliath in the great uh, story, uh, becomes a hero to the people. Saul becomes insanely jealous and then tries to kill David multiple times, including in this story where he sends 3,000 men out for the express purpose of finding David and killing him before he can become king. Now, here's the pattern. Saul's position and power lead to pride. His pride leads to disobedience, insecurity, jealousy, and rage. So even though Saul's been chosen by God, even though he's tall and handsome, even though he's been given great power and great position, Saul became a very small man. And the more he tried to make himself great, the smaller he became. So that's the first part of the story. Second part of the story I'm calling the greatness of David. The greatness of David. I'm gonna, here's where I'm going to show you the second little um, movie clip. And I remember this one just as I was, as I was going through this, this study because I, uh, it's the most recent effort to make a Superman movie. It was called Man of Steel out a few years ago. And it, I was interested in that movie, really wanted to see it because it claimed to tell you the beginning of the story of Superman when he was a boy. Okay? And I wanted that was curious to me. And it turns out that the only really good scene in the whole movie to me is this one I'm gonna show you now. So Clark is a young man, he's in high school, and he's being bullied by uh, some high school tough guys, and he has to decide whether he's gonna fight back. Now, he already knows he has powers. He has to decide whether he's gonna fight back or not, so watch this scene. Come on, Kent. Come on, fight back! Get up, Kent. So is that it? Is that all you've got? Come on, Ken. Come on!
Did it hurt you? You know, they can't. It's not what I meant. I meant, are you all right? I wanted to hit that kid. I wanted to hit him so bad. I know you did. I mean, part of me even wanted you to, but then what? Make you feel any better? You just have to decide what kind of man you want to grow up to be, Clark, because whoever that man is, good character or bad, he's, he's going to change the world. So when I watch movies, um, I try to watch for what I call the Jesus moment um, in the story. And it happens a lot, even in very, very secular films. And this was my favorite scene because Clark's being mis uh, mistreated. He's being abused, treated unfairly. And he has the power. He's already Superman. He has the power to destroy uh, his bu the bullies completely. But he withheld his power for a greater purpose. You can see the dent in the... In the, in, the, in the fence and the steel post because he, he gripped it, but he didn't fight back. Uh, that's a Jesus moment because the New Testament tells us, and I'll get to this at the end today, that although he was God, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient even to death on a cross for a greater purpose. He withheld his power for us. Now we see that in this story of David as well. Verse 3, he, Saul, came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now I love the Bible. The Old Testament is, it's got these little honest details in it that just ring like somebody telling a story. Uh, why would you put this in there if it's not the way it happened? So Saul has to do what he has to do. He goes into a cave. Uh, David and his men, it says, were far back in that same cave. They're hiding. Who would have thought, right? The men said, who were with David, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give, you, give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now, a couple of things here. You might be thinking, now, you've got to be really, you be really doing some business not to notice somebody cutting off a corner of your robe. But he probably took his robe off and put it somewhere else while he did his business. But what, what I want you to see here is David's restraint. Where Saul lashed out at David in jealousy as an insecure bully, David exercised great restraint. Now we're going to see why. Verse 5. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men. Now, they were encouraging him, Dave, now's your chance. Kill him. You'll become king rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Here we see David's, what I would call his humility, where Saul became proud, allowed his pride to lead him into disobedience and poor decisions to protect himself and his position. David displayed great humility before God. Not only did he refuse to harm his king, he was conscience-stricken for just cutting off a corner of his robe. Because even though Saul was trying to kill David, David respected God. And as long as Saul was the anointed king that God had chosen, he was going to give him his allegiance. His allegiance was not to himself or his position or his future, but it was to God. Verse 8, then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my Lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing, a dead dog, a flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? 
May the Lord reward you for the way you treated me today. I know you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord, you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Now here we see David's faith. Where Saul was insecure about his position, about his future, about David, David was, on the other hand, very secure. He was not yet king, but he trusted God's promise for the future of his life. He refused to take matters into his own hands. He refused to make grave mistakes in judgment. He trusted God and trusted God's timing with regard to his future position as king. He refused to take matters into his own hands. Now, the rest of the story, we, if you read ahead, Saul uh, continues to follow this pattern of pride and fear. He disregards God, at one point even consulting a pagan uh, medium, uh, almost like a witch, uh, to, to discern the future. Eventually, uh, his enemies, the Philistines, catch up to him, and he winds up committing suicide by falling on his own sword rather being captured and tortured to death by the Philistines. That's how Saul's life ends. How it began? Tall, handsome, first king. How it ends? Falling on his own sword in fear and shame. David then becomes the, uh, the next king and the greatest king in the history of Israel, although we will see in future weeks how David eventually struggled with his own battle with power and pride. So what does this ancient story between these two men, these two rivals, teach us if it has anything to teach us? Well, I think there's all kinds of things here. First, um, I would say obedience matters. Obedience matters in small things and in big things. You know, so often uh, as men, we can think, um, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty good with God. I'm, I'm, not bad, I'm not as bad as that guy. I don't have this problem or that problem. But obedience in little things matters. Saul waited seven days. He didn't wait a couple hours more to obey God. Obedience matters. Second is our position is from God. And it's to be used to honor God and serve others, not to serve ourselves. Now, none of us here are kings. We don't have that kind of position. But we do have position as men. We, have, we are husbands. We're fathers. We have jobs. We have resources. Everything we have is a gift from God's hand. And it's to be used to honor him and serve others, not to serve ourselves. Thirdly, pride is ultimately destructive. And pride's a weird thing. Pride kind of works in the dark. It works in the dark. It only rears its head in certain times and certain places. But pride is ultimately destructive. Humility is ultimately rewarded. Finally, our security, our worth, our hope is not in our position. It's not in our accomplishments. But it's in God. And now if we jump ahead to the New Testament, I've been telling you all the way along as we dig into these Old Testament stories, the whole purpose of the Old Testament is to point us to the New Testament, and the message of the gospel. But if we do that and we jump ahead, what we see is that the Bible teaches us that we all have a little bit of Saul in us. We all suffer from Saul's problem. That is, we are instinctively and most naturally proud. We are proud. We want to make the rules. And so the result is we sin against God, we sin against others, we sin against even ourselves. But Christ came into the world, what we celebrate at this time of year, Christ came into the world to give himself on our behalf as the final sacrifice for our sins so that we can have a new heart through forgiveness of sins, New identity, not based on our accomplishments, but his accomplishment on our behalf. New purpose, not to live for our kingdoms, but to live for his kingdom. And new destiny, which is not death, but life everlasting, our new destiny with him in heaven. But to receive that gift, we must humble ourselves and recognize our need. Here's the question I want you to deal with around the tables today. I'm going to add one again, so get your pencils ready. First, have you ever worked for a boss who made life miserable for his or her employees? Explain. Most of us know what it is to have a, have a lousy boss or a lousy job at some point. Maybe, we, maybe the guy didn't chase us around to caves trying to kill us, but we had a lousy boss. Do you have a lousy boss story? 
Secondly, what does the story of David and Saul teach us about respect, integrity, and authority? Finally, here's the question I want you to get to and write it down. What role has pride played in your life? And how does pride still tend to show up today? I think that's a good question. I wish I would have thought about it months ago when I put this together. How has pride played a role in your life, and where does it still tend to show up today? Get some coffee, get a donut, go through these questions. We'll wrap you up at about 10 till 7.